Fair Trade is a global movement based on the belief that workers in developing countries deserve to earn a living wage. A simple idea that can mean the difference between life and death. Movements are not fueled just by ideas, however. There are always individual stories of suffering and sacrifice. Tamara Johnston is a fair trade activist and entrepreneur, but when I met her, she was a troubled 13-year-old. By the time she moved into the apartment next door, we belonged to each other, like family. I was there when she started the fair trade business with her twin sister Shelby and her brother-in-law Steve. I know it is much more than an entrepreneurial enterprise. Tamara's story of fair trade, like most, is about survival. In this case, her own. Shelby and uh, this is Tamara, my twin sister, and my husband Steve. And together we started a business called Antibody, which is, I guess, more or less a skincare business. We do soaps and lotions. Individually, we had all been interested in the fair trade concept. And so we looked a little bit into purchasing ingredients, fair trade, and marketing a product that was fair trade. And how we got into that was we, the three of us never planned on starting our own business, certainly not together and certainly not skincare. But it's about two years ago, November, a really good friend of ours, well actually Tamara's boyfriend, Matthew, was unexpectedly killed in a car accident. And from that instant, life changed for us. It looked different, it felt different, it began to mean something different. I think realizing how our friend Matthew was here one second, gone another second, it brought it home to us that, you know, we never know when it's our time to go and we want to make some kind of imprint on this earth. And it just so happened to be that for us, our regular nine to five job weren't present. I think Matthew died. Well, I know he lingered, but I think his, his spirit was gone as soon as he was hit. I thought this has to be a mistake. I told people you don't understand, this 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 can't happen. It's not going to happen. And I was I was angry, I was confused, I was scared, everything. One morning, like all mornings, I drove into work thinking, I love my life. I had a great job in the film industry at Image Movers, working on projects that were exciting. I had a cute apartment, cheap rent with neighbors that looked out for me, a little community. Close to my sister and her husband, lots of friends, faith in God, and Matthew. That night, it all turned to dust, everything. I really think that hell must feel a little bit like that. The driver was an elderly woman, 80-something, lost control of her minivan as she passed Matt getting out of his red truck. She panicked. She meant to hit the brakes, but she slammed the accelerator instead.
the neighbor called me and she said, Matthew's been in a car accident. She actually saw the accident and um, went out to hold Matthew as he was dying. I got off the phone really fast and just freaked out. I didn't know what to do. I was in rush hour traffic and I felt like the only way to get there fast enough was to get out of the car and start running. I got off the exit I was supposed to and I followed his ambulance in. Tamara got on the phone and I have, I don't even know what she said. I just instantly knew this is bad. So I said, I'll be there in five minutes. And no one said anything to me. I just walked in and sat there with Tamara. And it just felt like death. Like, this is not us. This is not us in this room right now. Everything was a little bit foggy, and yet I could not believe it was me. Gosh, it was awful. The whole night, the whole morning, everybody, my family was telling me, friends were telling me, nurses were telling me, get some sleep while you can. I thought, you're crazy. These are the last minutes I'm ever going to spend with Matthew in this life, and I'm going to go to sleep. I felt like I didn't have enough time. In your face amidst the stars It's time to go to bed We read those books you read of I was depressed when I was young and faith was the thing that saved my life. I mean a real faith in God. For me, it was not just some vague form of spirituality. I had a relationship. That's probably the combination that drew me to Matthew in the first place. We were alike. Two misfits, introverted, troubled, but also with a sense of the eternal. We were only 13 then, Shelby and I. Matthew was 14. It took years of moving in the same circles to finally come together. Well, it took him years. I knew from the first night I met him. When I saw him, I knew. A decade later, it was impossible to imagine being apart. He was never far from me. The whole world was too small for that. On the night he was killed, he had in his pocket the cash to pay for an engagement ring for Tamara. He was going to propose. At the memorial, she was articulate, passionate, clear. She knew who Matthew was. She knew who she was. I want to thank you for all being here and for showing your support and love because I know he sees that. He knows that. So. I have learned amazing things in his death. He is still giving to me. In his death, he has given me permission to not hold back, to risk everything, to go for it. And as our favorite band said, Bono, to dream out loud. Mm. I'm going to do that every day of my life. I've dedicated that to him. She challenged everyone to respond by living fully. I think everyone thought, well, she's going to be okay. I don't really remember what I said. I kind of do. But almost hearing myself outside, I was thinking, wow, you're really saying this? And then after that day was over, it felt to me like, like I don't know, like all the lights went out. That next minute, I, I would have taken all that back. I, I meant it, but I didn't feel it.
I kept remembering what she said to me that night at the hospital. I can't lose him. And I thought, no, you can't. But that doesn't mean he's not gone. This life is so temporal, and I, ever since Matthew died, they always say this, but time is so short. You know, we never know when it's our time to go, and we want to make some kind of imprint on this earth. It kind of like grabbed heaven, and it kind of stuck it right next to all of our heads, and it was like, it, it became important to, to see something change in this world. What we were doing on our regular day-to-day -day jobs just ceased to mean the same thing for us. Steve just earned his master's degree in electrical engineering and working for NASA for four years. I worked on the Space Interferometry Mission, which is a big space telescope that is going to measure the distance to the stars, amongst other things. I appreciate what it's for, and I'm really into it. Like, I mean, I loved working there. It was a blast. But there was always that feeling that was like, you know, I'm leaving my family every day to do something that we're at the core of my being. Like, I just, I don't really believe in it. I was working uh, towards a master's degree in art history. So I was in the pursuit of some kind of research or working in the museum curatorial field. Everything I pursued as far as education, as far as career-wise, it was kind of like art history. Okay, great, but after a certain point, why am I doing this? And at the time that Matthew died, Tamara was working in film. She was working at DreamWorks doing movies such as The Polar Express and Monster House. Had a really prestigious career going in that direction. Her job before, before Matthew's death, I think she enjoyed it because we couldn't work for greater people. She's got a job that anyone who wants to be in the film biz are looking at her from a distance. And this is a girl that has direct contact with Robert Zemeckis, one of the biggest directors, and is on the phone almost every other day with Tom Hanks, one of the biggest stars. I mean, she's got the job in the center of the industry with people that she respects. I felt like, oh, I'm part of something. I think everyone wants to belong to something. And I felt like I belonged at Image Movers. And it was filmmaking. I thought, OK, I've, I've arrived. Tamara wasn't just a coworker. She was a family member. I remember my first morning, of course, I was a little nervous. And I was like so bright eyed and excited about everything. Oh my god, we meet Tom Hanks. How exciting is that? I started as a production assistant on the Polar Express. I became Steve Starkey's, the producer of Robert Zemeckis. I became his second assistant. And then from there, I became his first assistant. It wasn't an easy job by any means, especially during production. Get up really early. I would get up at 4.15 to be out at Culver City by 5, and it was long hours, and leave at about 8 o'clock at night. When I thought of my, of a more holistic picture of my life, that's when I thought, wait a minute, I'm coming home sometimes at 9 o'clock at night to have dinner and go to bed, and that's it. Wake up, do the same thing the next day. I'm waking up to die. That's not going to cut it. At the time, there was a school being built in Matthew's name. And we thought, if we could just raise a little bit of money and contribute, then that will give us some sense of purpose, especially in the early days when there was just nothing but grief and almost that disbelief. And one thing led to the next. And before you knew it, that wasn't enough for us. And so individually, we had all been interested in the fair trade concept. And so we looked a little bit into purchasing ingredients fair trade and marketing a product that was fair trade. So we're giving decent wages to um, developing countries to provide us with some of our ingredients. And before you knew it, that wasn't enough. That time was surreal. I wasn't sleeping. I was angry with anything that was alive for living instead of Matthew. Before Matthew died, we had made plans to go to Santa Fe. I asked if she still wanted to go, and her answer was, it doesn't matter where I go, he's not going to be there. 
I knew that Joshua Tree National Park was a deeply symbolic place for both of them, so I asked her if she wanted to take a detour and drive through on our way to honor him. The closer we got, the more I felt like we were entering the valley of the shadow of death. The longer we drove, the darker it got in every way. I am a boy, faring stranger, wandering through this world of woe. There's no sickness, toil, or danger in that bright. We listened to a CD mix that Matt made for me of Johnny Cash singing hymns. The music made Tamara like a sieve. She just took in everything through her pores and bled everything back out. We got to Joshua Tree around sundown and she showed me where she thought Matthew's ashes should go. And then we realized that his body was still intact back at the mortuary. We were driving away from all that was left of him. Tamara hadn't eaten or slept for days. At one point, I looked over at her and thought, she's burning down to ash too. I saw death on her face, that sunken skull-like appearance, and a wave of fear came over me. I pulled over and I said, I think you are dying. She just nodded. After a long silence, she looked at me as if already from a great distance, and she whispered, I can't choose. I told her the only thing that makes sense to me is to go forward, and she nodded, but I think she didn't expect to go on living, so it didn't matter to her. And in a way, she was right. The life she had before was totally gone. I'm going home to see my loved one. He said he to go in over Jordan I'm only going over home I'm only going over home I'm only going over I remember thinking it was my first night back at my place and I was so exhausted that first night. Every which way, I think I wanted to be home. Mm -hmm. I can sort out the monsters later, go to bed. I woke up and thought I had made it to hell. I was so convinced that I was gonna die when I woke up, I thought, uh-oh, wrong turn. I'm in hell. And then after I realized, oh, no, I'm still alive, that really surprised me, and I was you know, very angry and very disappointed. When I returned home, I moved back into my apartment, made plans to go back to work. I went back for a couple days, but like an hour a day. And I would go for an hour, sit at my desk, and then have to leave. I no, didn't last long. We all discussed, you know, what can we do? Like, should we talk to her about it? Should we see if she brings it up? You know, what's the best that we can do for her? Initially, I was just concerned about Tamara and wondering, you know, 
how she was doing with the shock of it all and if there was anything anyone could do to help. These people had really stood by me. None of those stories how Hollywood eats its young. They sent gift baskets, called, wrote, saved my job for me. I got cards and books and letters and flowers. But I had to quit that job. All I knew to tell people was that I needed something that had eternal value. Something that impacts the soul. Almost that disbelief. And one thing led to the next, and before you knew it, that wasn't enough for us. And so we created this business called Antibody, which was the meaning behind it was kind of spreading immunity against poverty. The whole concept behind Antibody is to support the fair trade movement and what, and what it's about. And fair trade is, is a global movement of different organizations that, that kind of promote a new way of doing business with poor countries. It's kind of that new paradigm. It's, it's a way to take the typical market economics and try to wield them for a little bit more of a better purpose. Some of the typical fair trade things is, is that you try to bypass all middlemen as much as possible. So there's as few strings as possible between, between the manufacturer or the retailer and the producer. Antibody does that in that we work with a co-op in Togo, Africa that makes shea butter and coconut oil and palm oil and all these raw materials that we buy directly from the co-op and we manufacture our products out of it here. So every day, all day, we're usually making something. Soap, lotion. Can you talk a little bit more about how this artifact actually happens? Like who gets their hands in what? Like... So it all started, the original endeavor was gonna be make, to make these like sugar scrub things, you know, to like scrub the junk off your off your uh, feet and that kind of stuff. I kind of said, you know, you guys aren't gonna make any money selling, selling sugar scrubs. You can't sell enough sugar scrub to really make something happen. You guys should do something a little more accessible like soap. We were talking about making this, are we making that? I'm like, no, 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 we gotta make soap. Everybody uses soap, right? We initially started thinking of soap because we wanted something that was, I'll say, easy to make. We found out later it wasn't so easy. I kind of got a little more involved in it because there's a zillion different types and there's all kinds of different little things that are in each one. It's very much like an engineering thing. Oh, yeah! It's not fun work. It's hot. It's a lot of physical labor where I'm lifting heavy things and mixing things, mixing the lye, choking on the fumes, burning my hands when the soap recipe's not right. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Again, I said this is going to start out being a little side job, hobby for us. But what was a great idea turned out to be months and months of experimentation. And hand burning. And hand burning <laughs> of how to actually make a bar soap that works, that functions. You should have seen us washing our hands. We're like, is it burning? I don't think so. Is it? No. I feel a tingle. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Take it in the shower. You mix one little thing wrong and it's, it's not soap anymore. It's not really soap anymore. It burns. <laughs> and um, so we were doing that in our kitchen for the first probably We probably made half. soap like every two or three days. We probably made a batch of soap for and six none of months it straight. None of it worked. <laughs> There's like eight million little itty bitty things and it's like you put them all together and it makes something like really cool, you know? <laughs> Their fair trade business went very well, with the exception of making them any money. Within six months, Tamara seemed to be recovering successfully. On the surface, she was strong and determined. She dove into learning about and advocating fair trade with a vengeance. If asked about future plans, she could tell you what the next 50 years were going to look like, how she was going to change the world. Only a few of us knew that her internal world was very different. Once in a while, I would catch it at the tail end of an expression on her face, just a brief flash of sorrow. It was constant. I thought about death all the time. I wanted to die. Why not? I believe in heaven. Now Matthew was there. 
here, Johnny Cash died of a broken heart. Love like that, that thing just tears you apart. I don't think that I have even come close to love like that. Well, I think that you just know. She took a bath every night before she went to bed. When I heard her turn the water on and turn the water off, I knew she was in there, so I would knock on the wall as a way of saying you're not alone. After a while, I would knock on the wall to make sure she was still alive. Her nightly bath became where she negotiated with God. I will give you five years if you show me a life worth living. I mean a life where I know exactly why I'm here. For Matthew's death, five years. She and I had started to refer to her bath as the purgatory. It took us a long time to realize that purgatory means the place to be cleansed. I hear Johnny Cash died of a broken heart. Love like that, that the thing just tears you apart. And I ain't expecting much from this beat up world. But oh, to have a love like Johnny Cash had for her. Well, thank you all very much for coming. This is my second Rotary Club meeting today. Today we're going to hear from an entrepreneur that really was exciting to me. She and her twin sister and her twin sister's husband have formed a company called Antibody. And I thought it was interesting in the Wall Street Journal just two days ago, they had all two columns all about fair trade and social entrepreneurship. Thank you very much, Tamara Johnston. What makes this company so exciting is the platform that we stand on. It is a fair trade business, and fair trade is simply paying a decent or living wage to developing countries. For our shea butter, we pay six times the amount of what we would normally pay. So we do pay a lot, but that price goes down the more bulk we buy. That actually lowers that price. To cope with the cost of buying the fair trade ingredients, we have to buy everything else in like huge quantities and just bulk, bulk, bulk to make up for the cost of the fair trade stuff. And, and I mean, we don't make as much money on each cell. Every penny you get out of it, you're putting right back in to invest in more equipment and better ingredients. The trade-off of choosing sometimes a more meaningful career, not being able to buy groceries some weeks. I want to go buy a cup of coffee, but I don't have the money. But I think we can do it. I mean, I think that's what, for me, that's one of the big driving factors that really motivates me is to, is to show people that you can start a business based on fair trade principles. Got that, dude? Steven actually came up with antibody, kind of a play on words. You know, an antibody creates immunity and fights off disease and negative things kind of was cute. And it also gave the opportunity for a cute slogan, anti-poverty, beautiful body. Being on our way to 10,000 Villages to deliver our order, a little fair trade shop that just opened up down in Pasadena. What we're really focused on is, is making products that are fair trade but that are accessible to a mass market. Hand-woven bird knickknacks, stone-carved 
statues, handwoven scarf made of llama fur, you know, it's like there's only so much of a market for that. But the nice thing about soap is everybody uses soap, everybody needs it, you use it up, it's done and you have to buy more. This co-op that we work with is predominantly women. There's 62 female employees and three men. And they are now the leaders in their community. They are now the most respected members of their society and their women. We're able to pay them a higher wage for what they're making. They have sick leave, their, you know, their child care, things that in Togo are very, very rare. With something like soap, I think that alone is not enough. But adding the fair trade element and doing something that's helping more than just myself, helping a larger community, especially in Africa, one of our dollars goes a long way over there. So, you know, working hard over here, it actually exponentially increases the value of the life whoever we're trying to help with the fair trade process. Right now, most of my job is done online, emailing, contacting, phone calling. Did you contact the, the New Jersey office or the... No, it's the, from UK. And it's also working with the Fair Trade minutes. Federation and with different organizations that can kind of help get antibody off the ground. So it's a lot of networking, it's a lot of dead ends, it's a lot of being creative and innovative in how you try to sell what your idea is. The first time I went to a convention, Shelby and I went, and we were scared to death. We walked in and then walked out. We thought, okay, I can't do this. Now, because I have an interest in it, it behooves me to kind of see the way people are presenting. But it's still otherworldly to me. It's all high-end, beauty first, image first. Girls with t-shirts that say, ask me if they're real. What more does you want? So we have 101 nail polish selections. We have cellulite, massages, several different tanning booths and sprays. If somebody would have told me even a year and a half ago that I'd be here, it would have freaked me out. got to this place where the numbness started to wear off. I was waking up, but I was also drifting, observing myself outside my body. People were starting to say it was time to get over it, time to move on. I learned to stop telling these people how I really felt. In fact, I hardly talked to anyone about that. The best way to describe it is feeling like there was a, a murderer in the house. There was something so tangible after me that it was frightening. That was everywhere for me, especially, you know, in the wee hours of the morning when things become more haunting and lonely and you're in your solitude, but, you know, also in the, on the street in your car, even in the most safe places, I was looking for what death thing was after me. And, also the fear that I might do something to myself because I wasn't rational. Steve did not want to go over there because he just said it felt so weird in there. It felt like death. And I remember thinking, yeah, it does. I think everyone felt that. It just felt almost evil, like she was allowing something to kind of take over her life and, and everything about her. I don't think she realized what she was allowing to, to happen. Since Matthew, he, I mean, he was hit as soon as he got out of his truck. So when I would park my car, I would look behind me and wait till a car was approaching before I'd get out, hoping the same fate would, would find me. It was almost like it would take over me and it would, it was close to happening because it, I, I love to imagine my death anyway. You know, what would make her feel better at the end of the night was, she'll listen to sad music, she'll smoke a clove, She'll have a glass of red wine, and then she would cut herself. And, you know, I saw her arm. She'd hide it at work, but she showed me her arm, and it was from wrist to, you know, elbow covered in marks. Uh, it made perfect sense to me, but it, it escalated so fast. 
that I couldn't control it anymore. So it wasn't something just when the pain got so bad or I needed to make sense of something, I had to do it every other hour. I had to work really hard to scale back. And then smoking took the place of that. And, you know, that also becomes addicting. And how you have to scale back. I have been through a lot of those kind of coping things with her. We had been through different eating disorders our whole life and struggles in our childhood. And that was kind of always our thing is, what do we have to look forward to? Like, tell me something good. And she still did that even after antibody had already started. Tell me something to look forward to. I know for sure that starting antibody gave her, gave her a sense of purpose that she, she needed. But I don't think that, that you can't just trick yourself into thinking, I've got purpose. You've got to genuinely want to live. <laughs> we haven't even done much as marketing goes, but we have salons calling us and private labelers calling us, people with boutiques that are opening asking if they can sell our products. I, I dig on all the like little nitpicky pain in the butt stuff no one else wants to do, like figuring out how to work the UPS website so that I can ship all my stuff in like the most efficient manner and like finding the little spray can of acrylic stuff so that the labels don't scrape off, printing the labels so they look right. I love doing it. I'm like super AR about this kind of stuff too, like everything has to be right about it. I think every business has to have one of those people that drives everyone else crazy. When you mess them up, that's what they look like. That's a little, that's a little crooked. The last three days I did 225 lip balm tubes. If I had like a million dollars to buy like a bottle of like every essential oil on the planet, I'd be thrilled. It's, it's, uh, it's, it is, it's like this total like geek heaven. Bath bombs are probably the most finicky of all the products that we make. It's quite an easy process, but at the end of the day, if the humidity's not right, if the temperature's not right. Oh yeah, it's a blast. There's nothing more you can do. You get to put it all together in just the right way. You put all this time and labor into mixing ingredients. A little bit of, you know, lecithin mixed in with the emulsifying wax and the shea butter and... Making the bath bomb, you put it aside. And it turns out perfect at the end, you know. And the next morning, they're all cracked or they're all kind of exploded and they look like something from another planet. And it all comes together and it makes this amazing thing in the end. And all that work and all that money is absolutely useless. No. No. Initially, we started out with Julian Gray Mosier, and as close of a friend as Matthew was to us, we wanted to honor him in some way. And of course, if he had lived a little bit longer, he would have been his uncle. So we decided to change his name to Julian Winfield Gray Mosier, which is Matthew's middle name. <laughs> Every morning, Julian and I have our routine. I come in, he welcomes me, and he has me pick him up, and then he plugs in my computer. And then he and I go in the kitchen, and he does the, the whole process with me. Cool. As time went on, and especially as the surface life seemed better and better, she sank deeper. If on the surface everything is going so well, what's it going to take to transform that part of her that still wanted to die? Your name is love. In love receive my prayer. Cause I wonder if there's mercy still for me. One night in the purgatory, I started to feel chastised, reprimanded gently. Why do you keep coming to me with this? I felt ashamed. I was apologetic. But I still wanted to die.
They can find the strength they need. They can find the strength in the strong arms of your love. We understand the logistics of fair trade, but what does it really look like? And we thought, well, we want to see firsthand how it is that we are affecting these women. We get coconut oil from this co-op in Togo, and I could probably get even fair trade certified coconut oil cheaper from some other places. But I don't because we work with this co-op, and that's the one that we, that we purchase from. And, and it's just kind of to fight as the market fluctuates and things happen that these producers have some stability. We're continuing our support in the fair trade movement by actually trying to create some kind of a relationship. It's one thing to say you have a relationship with them, but you've never even met them or see where they live or how they live and how they get their ingredients to us. It's true, the women stir up the shea butter in Togo, they put it in a wooden box, it shows up in a port in Olympia, Washington, where they put it into a bucket and they ship it to our doorstep. We buy our uh, fair trade shea butter and coconut oil, but specifically shea butter from these women. And I was actually fortunate enough to be able to go there. Angie Body sent me, and I was able to meet the women that we support. The journey to Togo turned out to be as tough as the one through Joshua Tree in some ways. But if Joshua Tree was the way into the valley of the shadow of death, then Togo was the journey back out. I'll soon be free from every trial This form shall rest beneath the sun I'll drop the cross of self-denial And go a-singing home to arrived at the depot, there were tons of vans around on this big dirt parking lot. We were thrown in the back seat of this van that snugly fit 15 people. I had to sit sideways, trapped by these guys, and it was just hot, at least in the 90s, and humidity is 150%. But when we were on the road, there were 27 of us, not including three chickens and two babies. I thought, we'll never find this place because it's the middle of nowhere. I was nervous that this is going to be Tamara's trip to Africa and like no antibody story out of it, and nothing about fair trade. And I said it over and over and over. I'm here for antibody. I'm here to meet this woman. the place. I thought, this is it. I was speechless for two days. Just seeing these women, meeting these women, seeing the environment they worked, I was blown away. The difference, the, the character of these women, just because of how much they believed in themselves and how others viewed them as well, it was awesome. This co-op is the manager's female and there are 62 female employees and three male employees, and it runs like clockwork. They work great hours, seven to two, three o'clock, and these women are absolutely respected. Women are not regarded in the same way in Africa as they are in the States. So the way they treated others and the way they were treated 
It's very different. Men and women look up to them as the success of this area. They're the stability in their community. One had explained to me through an interpreter that her husband had died and she was left with no means of survival until she found this job. And so because of that, she and her kids were able to live on. My story even seems so comfortable compared to theirs that I have no right. I can't give up. I can't just walk away. There are 65 people right now in Togo, Africa, whose lives are impacted by the fact that you decided not to kill yourself two years ago, period. Mm -hmm. What does that statistic look like 10 years from now? It's 50 times as much, at least. I know Tamara thought she died when Matthew died, and she felt like, okay, I'll spend the rest of my life settling for just being content at the best. When she least expected it, she realized, no, it's not just a matter of just being okay for the rest of my life. There's actually another, a whole new chance for me to have a whole different separate life, and a good one. Working with my family, being around my sister, whom I tied at the hip with anyway, and Stephen and Julian, my quality of life shot through the roof. Lemon. I got lemon. Whenever it's my time to go and be with God, I want to look back and say, did I touch somebody's life? And at the end of it, what does it matter if I'm really making soap? It has to be something more mean meaningful than just that. I think people are really the only thing on this planet that lasts forever. So especially after Matthew died, you know, all the stuff that he did and all the projects, all the Matthew photographs and all that stuff was a big part of him. But at the end of the day, it's how Matthew affected other people and those relationships to other people that are going to be still around when we go to be with him. That's what's important, you know, it's like whether I ever meet them here or not, you know, maybe when I'm dead, I can meet those women that live in the co-op and, you know, in our one little slice of, of life, try to make a difference in, you know, if we hadn't gone and seen it for ourselves, it, it would have been madness. It, I think it fueled us even more. We're just making soap. People are just buying soap. But these women's lives are actually changed. Their whole life, their kids' lives changed. There's only so much that we can actually get fair trade to make our products out of. And so to circumvent that lack of resources, we are going to try to start up some of our own little fair trade co-op ventures. How awesome would it be to actually create even more jobs. I just kind of asked, okay, is there anything you need from us? Being more polite, like, what do you need from us? What can we do? And her response was, D do more. We want more jobs. If you help start it, we will carry it on from there. They had hands open like this, just fill it, we'll do it. Um, that was exciting to me because it, it again, forced me to look at, wait a minute, I could do this. They're not asking somebody else. You don't question whether or not somebody else might be better at this than you mm -hmm. are. You're the one that's there. Yeah, that kind of ignited something and I mean, oh, I guess we could. We'd like to go beyond Togo and not just, you know, open up co-ops there. We'd like to go anywhere that could use, that could use a fair trade system. A, a direct connection that we initiated with a co-op somewhere is going to be really cool. That's totally a dream now. You I, said it. I you know. said it out I into the it. air. I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I can't, I can't believe it's picked up as fast as it has. I mean, I thought we'd be having trouble making sales and getting orders, and we're having trouble fulfilling the orders that we have because we don't have enough equipment or people to like get stuff made. And so it's like, you know, the bottle filler is on its way from Indiana and we're buying industrial equipment to like stick in our garage, it's ridiculous. To be at this spot where we're almost, how do we keep up with the orders? How do we keep up with the attention? And that's a great problem to have, to stress out about how we're gonna get these orders out by tomorrow. And that's 
that's completely a God thing. We should not be at this place at this time in the business as young as we are as a business. At the same time, people are not only buying the product because it's good for them and it's natural, but they're also actually doing communities a world of good just because they're buying a fair trade product. So just, because, just by staying clean or by keeping your hands moisturized, people are surviving that you don't even know about. Undeveloped canister of Matthew's film sat around my apartment for a year and a half. Then the envelope sat there for a long time. Finally, I opened it to find photos of me and Matthew. And one I totally forgot taking, of him walking on the trail ahead of me. I had no doubt then that I would someday catch up when I took that picture. That's how I feel now. I know why I'm here and I know where I'm going. I'm not in a hurry for either one. There's time for everything. I guess that's what I've learned that defines eternal life. There's time for everything that matters. I'm only two years into my bargain, my trade, with God, and I feel like He's given it to me already. Really understanding, whether it's here or several thousand miles away, in one day there can be so much change in, by just surviving one extra day. I don't want to die anymore. I know it's not my time and I still have lots left to do. I can't even believe that's me that I'm talking about still because it sounds so foreign to me. I feel like what I said at the memori memorial service is how I feel today. I don't want to be without that. Tamara's trip to Togo put her face to face with women whose suffering was at least as great as her own. She didn't find happiness, financial success, or an end to her sorrow. The women in that co-op were the answer to her prayers for a life worth living, because she saw that she might be the answer to their prayers for a life worth living. They belong to each other now. It's hard to see that and still beg God for death.
Spread love all over the earth. You say I want a revolution. 